Tamara Gradur on the line. Tamara, how are you? I'm good, thanks. It's nice to be here. Great to finally have you. I know we booked this a long time ago <laughs> um, in, in BC before Corona. Uh, right. So, but your <laughs> subject, yeah. your subject, is important now too. So, tell us a little bit about your backstory, uh, the organization you do, and we're going to dive into why innovation is more important than ever as far yeah. as organizations are concerned. Yeah, so I'll give you the, the Reader's Digest version of my story, which just tells you how old I am that I refer to Reader's Digest. Um, but basically, I grew up in advertising and then brand strategy and innovation. And what that really meant is I spent 20 years helping companies develop new products and services and marketing them. So if you've walked the aisles of Target, Walmart, your grocery store, you've probably passed products that I had a hand in bringing to market um, or rebranded once they got to market. Loved it. But, you know, Michael, I had this experience along the way that made me realize that giving people ideas was great, but what was actually more powerful was helping people understand and realize how they could think differently, how they could innovate. So for 20 years, I went behind the black curtain, did my magic, came back and then hoped the client did something with it. And as anyone who's in the consulting world knows, 95% of the time, nothing happened. And I had one time in particular that was very painful. They didn't do anything. Not only did they not do anything with it, but I got no buy-in from the leadership team because frankly, they were too jaded. They weren't innovative anymore. They, they had their own to-dos. There's a myriad of things. And it was in that moment that I realized, wow, if I could help people understand how they innovate and how they can see opportunities and solve their challenges, then things will happen and then action will be taken. And that's really at Launch Street, my company, that's why we exist because we decided that we were done just giving people ideas. We wanted people to have their own ideas. We want to show them how they can innovate in everything that they do. And, and the wonderful, I think part of that is what we've really come to realize over the years is that that's where you see the impact. Our clients, I think, love our work because what we're really doing is it's human potential. We're helping them reach a higher level and innovate and influence others to drive innovation and make an impact they seek. So it's funny because we're kind of this funny balance of innovation, but also the human potential side. Well, the work that you do, I think what's different than what you see with a lot of consulting agencies and firms is a yeah, consulting firm will come in and they'll do the slide deck and say, here's all the things you should do where yeah. your organization goes, okay, now let's actually look at what you have here. Mm -hmm. okay, let's collectively, let's start working together and we're going to sit back as the consultants and we're going to let you do the yeah. creation of your ideas. And when that happens, they get that confidence going, wait a minute, we can do this ourselves. And when they do that, not that they're going to fire you, you know, but they're, yeah. they're like, okay, great. Now, what, now what do we do? They, they, they grows that appetite. We're like, okay, now what can we do next? And all of a sudden you have this organization that was probably originally kind of rigid and trying to figure out what mm -hmm. the heck to do to this extremely creative and forward thinking entity that they show up to work every day and everyone is just excited. Like, okay, what are we going to create today? Wow, so, is that a fun place to go to? Oh my gosh, isn't that a fun place? And I'll tell you, I think as a leader, it's triply exciting because now you've got a culture of innovation and a team that's innovating with you. Um, you're over there as a leader being given the mandate to innovate, right? And to create that culture, but giving, so here's what we found basically. When you start with process and say, all right, people, here's a new initiative. Here's a new process for innovation we're gonna follow. What you tend to get is initiative fatigue, like another process to follow. Great, thanks a lot, Michael, like wonderful. But what we're really doing is saying, hey, no, it's people first innovation. Let's get your people to realize how they innovate and then we can all do it together. And you said something I just want to touch on really quickly that's important. You said something, um, I might get the words wrong now, but you said something of like, let's, let's look at what we have right in front of us. We are very big about how do you rearrange the pieces you have versus having to think outside the box all the time. Because the reality with outside the box is, well, where do you look? Where do you go? And then what happens when I have to go back to the box? It is my reality. That's why things actually get stalled. And the definition we use at Launch Street around innovation, because you and I both know, you ask 10 people their definitions of innovation, you get 100 different answers. Like nobody's really clear what it is. So the definition that we really rallied behind is think differently, 
about what's right in front of you to create a competitive advantage. And that really speaks to what you said. It's like, if you just think a little bit differently about everything that you have right in front of you, you can actually create incredible innovation without that pressure of outside the box that none of us really know what to do with anyway. Exactly. I mean, not to use a cooking analogy, but you know, I'm going to have chicken for dinner tonight and I haven't decided yet how I'm going to prepare it, but I'm going to look at the ingredients that I have and come up with something and yeah. be able to be that creative force to be able to say, okay, this is what we have. This is what we can do. And I love the analogy you said about outside of the box, because mm -hmm. you go outside of the box, like you said, you're looking around, you're like, wow, oh, there's a wasteland out here. I don't know where to go. And then you, you grab something like, okay, this might work. And then you turn around and because you've been wandering around, you're going in a different entrance. So you may have left from the finance department. Now you're going in via the marketing department and they're looking at you. Why are you here? And you're like, that doesn't fit in here. So it just it creates, yeah. see what you have. And then once you get clearer on what you have, it should be clearer. And I'm sure this is work that your team does. You're saying, okay, where are some opportunities for you to potentially mm -hmm. bring somebody else in with some expertise on that particular thing that can take your organization to the next level instead of just blindly hiring somebody to fill a role in some department. Say, we, we're looking for somebody with this specific skill set to add to this. And when organizations do that, it's amazing how quickly they can launch new products or services or refine things that they're doing to meet customer demand. Um, can I share a quick story with you on that? Because something kind of came to mind as you were talking. So we have something called the Everyday Innovators Tribe, and it's basically our membership platform that helps business leaders create breakthrough outcomes, accelerate success, kind of find those opportunities. And we had one woman in particular who was in it. We do these innovation jam sessions, these online innovation sessions. We were working through some exercises and she came up with this brilliant, she had this brilliant aha moment. So she works at a software, logistics software company. So, and they get clients and then they have to implement this new software, teach them how to use it. And then they become kind of their customer service, right? It's all in the transportation world. And she on the chat bar was saying, she said, you know, Tamara, we've been trying to come up with this um, blue skies solution to how to get more quality assurance and control and best practices to our clients. So we were coming up with all these crazy platform ideas and community ideas, all this stuff. And she said, we couldn't figure it out. And then we did this exercise together. And she said, and then I realized the answer was right in front of me. I have other clients who have done it really well, who are part of our community. Why don't I just connect them to our new clients? They would love to teach somebody else how to do it. She goes, the answer was actually right in front of me the entire time, but we were so busy to your point, wandering over here that we didn't even see it in the beginning. So, and I loved your, the way you said that about wandering, right? And then turning around and being like, oh, I don't even know what I'm doing over here. And it becomes this really frustrating one-way tennis match where you're like lobbing the ball over to marketing and they're over there, duck and weave. I don't, want, I don't want to do whatever it is you're talking about. I want nothing to do with it. And that's because those, those out of the box ideas are just not grounded in the realities we face. And that's not to say that rearranging the box you have becomes incremental. Not at all. What I have found is rearranging the pieces in front of you actually lead to bigger, bolder ideas than trying to play in this weird space. And I love the story about how you had somebody that was in your tribe that was an expert in something that somebody else needed. And instead yeah. of, and a lot of consulting firms do this, they'll say, well, we, we're going to bring out somebody to work in that, or we're going to work internally and do it where there's actually somebody that could do it much better yeah. as part of your tribe and say, let me introduce you to this. I mean, we do it all the time in referral business where we say, okay, someone says, does anybody know somebody that can do this? Yes, here's somebody, you do the introduction and you let them go about their way. But when it comes to business, when we're looking to do something within our organizations, yes, we may go out and hire a consultant to do something like yeah. that, but if it's a smaller component, just like a, a one-time initiative thing, it would be really nice to learn how to do this with this stuff that we have. And it would save those organizations a ton of money just to make that introduction, but again, it allows them to create additional products and services that they had basically all the ingredients together or like all the Lego or puzzle pieces together, but they couldn't build it because they just couldn't see it. And bringing somebody else in, it's like, oh yeah, you need to move this there and there. And you go, oh, 
Yeah, wow, that actually makes a huge difference. And I'm sure you find this with your clients too. I mean, the, the people that we work with, the leaders and teams that we work with, when they start to have their own ahas and their own breakthroughs and they come up with the ideas they actually get to implementation. And I really see my role when I'm working with, whether it's an individual leaders, like all the kind of the, all the leaders in our tribe, or I'm working with a client and a team directly, my job is to facilitate, guide, and provide that framework for them to innovate and think differently. They do the heavy lifting. And it's beautiful because when they do the heavy lifting, it actually happens. Because, and they get the things that I don't get. I mean, it'd be egotistical of me to go into any business and say, I have all the answers. Of course I don't, I don't live it every day. Um, but there's so much power in being able to think differently. I think unfortunately what happens is we just get bogged down by, well, a couple things. We get bogged down by to-dos and for whatever reason, over the years, we have been told or bought into this myth that we're not the innovative ones. It's Susie over here with a purple streak in her hair or the guy with the VP of enthusiasm title, but the rest of us, we don't get to innovate. And then we wonder why we don't get the innovation we need. Well, it's right in front of us, but those people, all the people on our team need to have permission to innovate for that to happen and to move forward. And I think as leaders, that's often where we miss the mark it's not, did we hire the right people on the bus? It's that did we create a bus that allows people to be their best. In fact, I got, had that conversation with someone just the other day. They said, but you need to get the right people on the bus. And I really pushed back and said, hold up. I really believe, and I've seen in my experience and our assessment that tells you how you innovate and all my work has really shown that everybody can innovate. How we do it is unique to us. And most of us will do it if given the room. So, before you ask, tell me you need the right people on the bus, I would really ask you, have you built a bus in a way that allows people to do that? And, and I've never understood, last thing I'll say is I've never understood why as a leader, if you have 100 people on your team, why would you only let three innovate? Why would you not want to tap into all the people on your team out there doing the work? I mean, there's so much untapped ideas and potential out there. There's so much. And the innovation and 100 people on the bus example is great because you said they're only letting two or three people do everything, but you've got somebody that's sitting in the corner that has expertise in this thing, but the organization either A, doesn't allow them to share that, or they just simply don't know that they have that interest. And that's one of the things as a leader, it doesn't matter how big or how small your team is, do your best to figure out the strengths of all of your employees. Mm -hmm. Figure out what motivates them, what they're really good at, in using the bus analogy, design the bus where they can thrive in their role. Because if they can thrive in their role, that's when they aren't going to work. They're going to do something that they love. And when they do that, creative juices flow. And when you're okay. rested, relaxed, and you enjoy life, and you enjoy your work, you will see things clearer, which mm -hmm. means you will also see opportunities when things come up. Right now, at the time of this recording, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. This is the time for people to have clarity and see opportunities to do things better or different than what they have been doing. And I see a mix of it. I see some organizations that have been able to pivot and they're doing great things. And I've seen some organizations that are wondering if they're going to open up again. And it doesn't have to be that way. They could have been more open to the things if that environment was there to do those kind of things in the first place. So what are some common things organizations could do to, and I know we've shared a bunch already, yeah. to create an innovative environment for their organization? Yeah, so um, I, have, I, oh my gosh, I have so many things swirling in my head, but let me answer that question. And then if I remember, I wanna go back to a restaurant example that really speaks to what you just said about taking the time now to innovate or not. Um, there's a couple of big things that you can do. And, and I would emphasize the fact that these are things you should always be doing to build a culture of innovation and to make that innovation happen. And I would say that right now in the pandemic that we're in more so than ever, you've got to really dial it up and make it a priority because I think as you were just alluding to, companies that innovate are going to be the ones that come out of this alive and doing well. And the ones that don't, that are waiting it out or just doubling down on what they already do, 
they're the ones that are starting to fade away and we're seeing that difference. Um, so here's the first thing I'd say for leaders. And, and like I said, this is critical across the board, reward behaviors, not outcomes. Here's the thing with innovation. You've got two results. Either it is cake on Friday because everything worked as planned and the initiative you know, worked, whatever it was, internal or external, or you've got the failure shelf and none of it worked. And as you and I know, and leaders out there know, sometimes you can control the outcomes and sometimes you can't. Sometimes the best initiatives don't work and the ones that you didn't think would work do, right? Assuming you go into both with good intent. However, that's fine. But if you're on the other end of that and you want your team to innovate, how likely are they if their two options are cake on Friday or the failure shelf? Pretty low because that's like playing Russian roulette with your, with your, um, with your roles, your responsibilities, your chances of success, right? How you're valued. So what I tell companies and leaders to do is reward behaviors that drive innovation and you'll get to the outcomes. So reward behaviors like um, rewarding your people for taking risks, reward them for disagreeing because debate is great for innovation. I reward my team all the time for disagreeing with me because I know that when they do that, we're going to have constructive conflict and we're going to get to stronger ideas. And I will tell you, Michael, that we don't know each other well, but I don't tend to use question marks when I speak, even when it's a question. And it's not because I'm not open to feedback. I just have a very declarative tone. And so I want people who are going to argue with me because I know that that's powerful for giving feedback, for collaborating. I'll, give it, I'll share an example with you. So I was leading this team of about 25 consultants um, back in my innovation consulting days. And I used to come, I was the VP of the company. I would come in and I would usually post a challenge or something I was working on that I was stuck and I wanted to get everybody's perspective on. And one week I posted this challenge and sure enough, by the end of the day, I had a little stack of sticky notes on my desk from the same three people that always gave me feedback. No, those people were amazing. I appreciate them, but I needed everybody's perspective in the office from the senior consultant to the office manager. I needed them all to give me their feedback for this idea to like to get to the right place. So I'm thinking, I'm like, what do I do about this? So I asked for more feedback, same thing. So one day I got super clever. So I go down to the coffee shop, I get a bunch of gift cards and I come upstairs and they, it was an op open office space. And I start probably yelling. I'd like to say, just speaking loudly, I was saying, so if you gave me a feedback, I'd be like, Michael, I just want everyone here to know that I appreciate that Michael spent the time to give me, gave, give me feedback. I don't even know what he wrote. I haven't even read it yet, but that's not the point. What matters is I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and the time that you took to give me some feedback. Here's your gift card. So, by the end of that day, as you can imagine, I had stacks of ideas from everybody in the office. Like I had to get more gift cards. It was a little bit out of control. But what that experience taught me was when I reward the behavior I'm looking for, pretty simple, I get more of it. So if you wanna drive innovation in your company, you gotta drive the behaviors that get you more innovation. You'll get to the outcomes. So if you really want to build a culture of innovation, reward behaviors, not outcomes. The outcomes are great. You can reward a big win. That's fine. But those behaviors are what really matter. Yeah, the behaviors are the things. That's the pattern that's that you want to repeat again and again and again. Because an outcome may be for a specific project or a finite situation where the behaviors of how they approach it, how they collaborate with others, how they seek input, how they handle mistakes and you know, yeah. bring it forward and, and be accountable for the mistakes, you reward those things because it, again, it, it, it conditions them to think, okay, yeah. I, I can do this and I can work in an environment where I can take risks and I can do some things and I know that I've got the backing from the organization to be able to do these things. And when people can operate in that environment, they actually make less mistakes because they're not afraid right of making a mistake and they bounce ideas right. off and and sometimes those ideas are you know you, you want to look at it it's like did you bump your head when you walked in but then <laughs> over time you look and you go actually that won't work here but that other project that we worked on six months ago that we were stumped on something that may actually be the breakthrough and Again, it just creates those ideas. It's, I like calling them shower ideas. Not that I tell people to take showers at work. Do that at home, please. But, um, but it's those things you know, where we're in there. That, that's the area where sometimes we get the, 
craziest ideas. That's why I always tell people, you know, if you get them all the time in there, get a little you know, whiteboard marker and put it yeah. high above the water so it doesn't wash away by the time you're done. But just, you know, wherever they, they work, it, it's create that environment where those ideas and innovative thoughts can, can, can grow. So I have the best product for you ever. It's called Aqua Notes, and it's a little waterproof notepad and pencil for your shower. I think it started out for boats. I love this product. It's one of my favorite because I have that all the time. Um, I love Aqua Notes. They're the best for anyone out there. Um, and let me just kind of add to, there's a couple things I just want to add to what you said. Um, I, I think if you listen to the story I shared about the feedback, I think the key in it, which is what you're talking about too, is I wasn't rewarding a good or a bad idea from my perspective. It wasn't about the feedback they gave me. It was about the behavior of giving me something. I did not judge or even read them until later. Then I did the job of analyzing. But had I rewarded Mindy for giving me a good idea I can use, then everybody's worried, is my idea good enough? And then they're going to shut down and perfection analysis comes in and I would have gotten nothing in return. So. I really want to highlight that because that really is the key in, in that story and in rewarding behaviors. Um, I want to really quickly mention the restaurant I said earlier, because it drives me nuts when people say open loop, like tell you something that becomes this open loop of, she said a restaurant, she never said it. So to your point about innovating through this pandemic and really thinking differently. So there's a restaurant, I live in Denver. There's a restaurant in my neighborhood um, that I loved and used to go to all the time. And then the pandemic happened, everything shut down. And I don't know if this happened in your city too, but suddenly everybody was shouting at the top of their lungs that they did to-go orders, right? Everybody was doing to-go. And that's fine for a little bit, but I don't know about you, but I didn't want to spend all my money on to-go one meal at a time. So it wasn't, that didn't really serve me. And on top of that, I actually had a bigger challenge, which is I have two teenage boys at home who are eating me out of house and home all every day, all day. And I'm making 10, what feels like 10 meals a day. So everybody's shouting to go orders, to go orders. This one restaurant in my neighborhood looked around and said, hold up, we live, we're in a neighborhood of families. What's the big challenge families have? 100 meals a day where they didn't have them before. So instead of just doing to go, they actually started to create weekly meal kits for lunches that you could buy the week. And then you had all your lunches taken care of. To me, that was a brilliant example of of real innovation. It wasn't just, oh my gosh, we're going to take what we do and just do it as a to-go. It was, let's think really differently about how we serve our market during all this. Because as you and I know, and I think I hear this all the time with the members in our tribe, is that this, what's happened, has created new opportunities and new challenges that we now need to solve. They are solving things and figuring out things that, that never existed six months ago, four months ago. So I think there's a huge opportunity to innovate in all this, huge actually, and a huge opportunity to really shift and think differently. Um, and you have more permission than ever before to do that because we're all changing so fast. I love the restaurant story. And there's one chain restaurant in our area that actually did something similar. Mm -hmm. um, it was like a meal kit for a, a, a one, just one meal, not the whole week. That, I love it. that is an amazing, you know, there's meal kits you can order, but for the restaurants, it makes a ton of sense because one, they've got the inventory, they've got their suppliers. And by them doing that, number one, they keep their suppliers working in a business. Mm -hmm. They keep, you know, right. some people at the restaurant in the restaurant, you know, alive in business because they've got some revenue. Of course, the servers aren't getting the money right now, but what that does is it creates an opportunity and, and much like what I tell people in the speaking business, for example, it's like, okay, right now we're not able to go and speak in front of audiences in the person because of the pandemic. So there's a lot of virtual speaking going on. And I tell people, it's like, when this is all quote unquote over, whatever that's going to look like, yeah, whatever like, that means. <laughs> yeah. It, it, we're going to, virtual is still going to be around and there's going to be in person. And when I talk to event planners, I tell them, don't close the door on virtual once you can start holding yeah. things again. You actually now have a new business line. You can have more frequent mm -hmm. events because, you know, it, it's a lot easier to put on an event virtually than it is you know, running a, a conference center and ordering, you know, 10,000 steel yeah. units and all the other stuff. So it's, it's easier to do that. So keep this and that way you can actually engage your customers more frequently over the period of the year and 
you may be able to charge them more. So from a revenue standpoint, it may actually grow your organization as well. So you take this time and look and say, how can we implement this into yeah. the grand scheme of things? Because I've had events that I was supposed to speak at that flat out canceled and they went, no, we're not going to do it. We'll see in 2021. And others are saying, we're going to virtualize it. Are you okay to do that? And so I've got a camera, a microphone, yeah. I do my own podcast show, I do video stuff. Uh, I think so. Yeah. So I think we're good. Uh, so I, for me, it was like, you know, it, it, there was no conversion for me to go from, I guess I'm not going to speak in San Diego, but I'm going to speak to the camera here. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. Yeah. You know, so, so it's just it, being innovative and, and being open and clear minded to be able to look at all the possibilities. And you know, some of them may be absolutely silly, but having the confidence, say, I'm going to put this out there and see how it lands having the freedom to be able to do that and that's that's how we get some of the craziest things that we use yeah. in our daily lives now someone had an idea to say you know what we need to have a smartphone no one, no one wants one of these things uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well i don't know if, if you're hearing this there's a couple i love that what you're just talking about because there's a couple things one is I'm hearing from a lot of my colleagues and clients who work in organ large organizations that they're actually enjoying working from home. And so their, their pushback to their companies who are now starting to open their doors again is like, hold up. I actually like this. So how do we make this part of our new normal moving forward? Because I'm actually more productive. And a lot of leaders are finding that about their teams are actually more productive. Um, so I think we're actually in, in this interesting place where people don't, to your point in the very beginning, people don't just want to go back to business as usual. They actually want these changes to last. And that creates new opportunities and new challenges, I think, for all of us and organizations. I will tell you just in full transparency in my own business, um, I, we did a lot of live events. So keynotes, workshops, team meetings, right? That was the bulk of our revenue in 2019 going into 2020. And then the rug got pulled out. Um, which was really frightening in the beginning and frustrating and all the things that we all felt. However, it's ended up being one of the best things for us because I really had to sit back and say, okay, how do we build Launch Street moving forward? Because we don't know when this is going to change or not change, right? So how do we do that in a way that actually allows us to continue to serve our community? And that's actually where the whole membership tribe and that whole thing came from. It was this funny little thing that I had in the back of my head for two years now, but all this other success was keeping me from doing it. And then this happened. I was like, well, I guess we have the time. But I just want to throw in a little nugget of value on that because, um, and I just went through this exercise on our tribe and our jam session. It's called, I call it jumping the curve. And I'm sure you've kind of heard that phrase before, but all of our businesses have a life cycle curve, right? We grow, we accelerate, we get to the top, and then we start to decline. You see it time and time again with businesses, there's no business that doesn't go through it. And the ones that really succeed are the ones that jump the curve to find a new one versus trying to just incrementally improve the curve that they're on. And that's true for you as an individual in terms of the value you bring and the skills that you have. And it's true at the organizational level. And one of the nuggets that I tell people when they're trying to figure out like, okay, I get it tomorrow. Like we got to jump the curve. Things are not going back. Our customers have new needs, new expectations. My employees have new needs and expectations, but how do we get from here to there? And my advice is you don't think about what you do, you think about the benefit you provide. So I'll just use me as an example and launch straight. If, if you ask me what I did, particularly January, 2020, I would tell you, oh, we help people ignite innovation through workshops, keynotes, right? All the things that we do. But if I tried to innovate off of that, it'd be really tough right now. I probably wouldn't be here talking to you. Instead, I thought, well, what's really the benefit that we provide? And I realized, oh, okay, we help people ignite their own ability to innovate so that they can solve their challenges, create breakthrough results, accelerate their success. When I thought about that, I realized, oh, wait, I could go online and really scale this business. And we get to have a bigger impact and have a much larger scale than we ever had with me bouncing from city to city to city. And it took a pandemic for me to realize that. And I would never wish this on any of us ever again, if ever. However, there is an incredible opportunity to shift now more than ever. And the beauty of it is right now, your customers, whoever they are, are gonna give you more leeway and more permission to innovate and make mistakes than ever before. Because guess what? We're all going through it and we get it. We're just happy you're trying to keep up. It's incredible advice, and I'm thrilled that you've seen the opportunity for it. Because again, it 
it creates you know, a, a new business line for your organization. And once things start opening up again, then you can say, all right, you know, we're going to do a little bit less of the travel, a little bit more of this. And, yeah. and, and, and if someone says, no, we want you to be here, well, then that's I'll make it happen. A, yeah, you can make it happen. Of yeah. course, you know, a, a premium rate because spoiler alert, I think the plane tickets are going to be pricey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if they, uh, especially if they're eliminating that middle seat, they're, they're not going to eliminate that income. So each mm, of your seats point. are going to be paying for that one. So, uh, but again, you know, if organizations want it, then they'll, they'll make it happen, pay for it. So tomorrow yeah. I've loved our conversation today. Where can people find out more about you and this incredible work you're doing? Yeah. So the hub of everything, the book, the assessment, the tribe, it's all at go to launchstreet.com. So G O T O launchstreet.com, all in word. I'll definitely have that in the show notes. So tomorrow, great to finally connect with you and love the work that you're doing and, and continue being well. Thanks. It's so nice to be here with you. Thank you.